turn that on? Turn that on. Go ahead. Welcome to the Hampton Beach Village District Monthly Meeting. No, that's something else. No. It's, it's Wednesday, December 9th, 2015. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Of course we can. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, are you guys ready? You want to start right away? So we have Jason, Julie, and Rayanne here to go over uh, some of the flood issues. Okay. Um, well, I'll start just by introducing the process. Uh, okay. Jason Bashan, town planner. I have uh, Ray and Diane, conservation coordinator, and. Um, Julie LeBranch from the Rockingham Planning Commission. Um, so, as you know, um, we applied for a PREP grant for the uh, Community Rating System Program to determine eligibility and uh, apply to that program, and we got that grant, and your uh, board uh, graciously uh, provided some in-kind matching funds for that. As part of the funding for that project, we've secured the services of the Rockingham Planning Commission to assist with determining our eligibility for the program and uh, applying to it and, and the activities that go with that. And we've asked Julie to come tonight to uh, talk to you a little bit about what they're working on for us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie. For 22, do we know? We'll put it against the flat. Anyone want anything from the audience? No, it's right here. Okay, stuck together. Hi, thank you for, for having us on your agenda tonight. Uh, my name is Julie LeBranch, and I'm a senior planner with the Rockingham Planning Commission. I think this is my first time ever in this building, but also before this, this, this precinct. Well, welcome. Um, thank you. So uh, just an update, I guess, on what we're working on and some of the working components uh, that, that are comp comprise uh, prepare preparing an application to the FEMA Community Rating System Program. <laughs> Excuse me. For some of you who don't know what that program is, it's a program where communities institute certain actions and activities and development standards and outreach and activity and information to their community that allows them to qualify for, for a certain number of points. And the point system is scaled to different uh, scales of point, different numbers of points, and the more points you get, the more of an increase in a discount and in flood insurance premiums residents can, can, can um, qualify for. So it's a community-based effort that, um, uh, that directly uh, provides a benefit to property owners in the, t in the community. So um, I, you have before you a couple of some, some papers, and I have a, a slight agenda here for you. We're going to go, th go through five different, different items. Um, the first being the, the first one item is the FEMA Community Rating System Information, and the, that's the first handout underneath the, the agenda. And you may, have, you may have seen some of this information before, I'm not sure. And I just wanted to give you a flavor for the types of activities that the community rating system um, offers incentives for uh, in, in the form of points in the point system. And then also the types of activities that garner the most significant points. Um, if you turn to page three, actually, it's the second page in, the, in, in this handout. And it, 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 the handout is com big community writing system on the front. There's a table, table one, at the bottom of the page. It's pa it will be page three. It's not numbered. And it tells, shows you the different classes. Uh, most communities enter the program at a, at a 10. Uh, most can achieve a 9 rating, which gives about a 5% uh, decrease or, uh, on flood insurance premium rates for, for, for property owners. And you can see the point range over in the far right corner. And you see as, as the 
the point rate class decreases to the ultimate of number one, the points are become increasingly greater, and that requires the community to do more activities. Um, so kind of turning the page. The rating system is comprised of what they call series of activities, and they range from 300, 400, 500, and 600. And the 300 series is public information. And this is providing information about flood risks, flood vulnerability, mapping, uh, hazard di disclosures, um, and other types of flood protection and flood assistance information. And you can see that one of the, one of the largest point um, gets under this particular series is outreach projects. And that's working in the community to bring information, to wor work with property owners, to you know, to, to answer their questions, to find solutions to any kind of problems that they have uh, that relate to flooding. So there can be a lot of um, points from just getting information out into the community. And so moving on to the next, uh, the next series, which is the next page, series 400, is mapping and regulations. And you can see that the points, the points in this particular series go dramatically increase uh, because of the nature of the activities themselves. And they, they include things like floodplain mapping, which you do have updated preliminary maps from FEMA on your flood insurance rate maps, which haven't been adopted yet. Um, but you also have flood mapping from the, uh, a, a project that the Rocky and Planning Commission just completed in September with all the coastal communities called Tides to Storms. And I apologize, I meant to bring some brochures about that. But we worked with each of the municipalities and the seven Atlantic coastal municipalities to map projected flood areas. So as sea levels rise and as coastal storm surge may intensify, how will that change and alter the floodplain over time? Whereas the floodplain may, may become greater with greater amounts of flooding. And so that's an additional layer of mapping that, um, that the community can get points for uh, under the community rating system above and beyond <coughs> what, the, what the flood insurance rate maps that, uh, published by FEMA do because those, re those maps are, are based on current conditions and not projected future conditions. And you can see uh, Series 420 is open space preservation. And it's one of the highest point, uh, point scorers in, amongst all the series, along with higher regulatory standards for development. Um, preserving open space in the floodplain uh, permanently guarantees that and reduces the risk of vulnerability and flooding and damage just because the, the, the land is kept in a natural and, and state in an undeveloped state. And so a lot of communities can, can actually uh, it really puts them over the top and allows them to gain a higher standing because of the higher point scoring um, that they, if they have a lot of land conservation in the floodplain. Uh, the other one that's the high scorer under mapping and re regulations is are the regulations themselves. And that, that includes things like elevating, requiring that buildings be elevated above what's called the base flood elevation, the 100-year floodplain elevation, so a couple of feet or two, one or two, three feet higher than that elevation ensures that they have a higher level of protection, and that type of activity gets a lot of points. Um, other types of activities include different types of zoning changes, like what kinds of land uses can be done in certain, certain high-risk flood areas, uh, what kind of buildings can be built, the, the way the buildings are constructed, um, and whether what's called compensatory storage is, is required. That means if you fill or, or, or occupy an area in the floodplain, you have to require, you have to create a storage area equivalent to that, to that in, elsewhere in the floodplain so that you're not taking away the flood storage capacity of the floodplain. Uh, another one that's a fairly high point scoring, scoring is stormwater management, which is really important, really challenging, as you, I'm sure that you know, in uh, being here down at the beach, when a large rainstorm comes in, particularly at high tide, it's very difficult for that water, that fresh water, to drain with the high tide levels. Um, so s managing stormwater and re reducing the amount of runoff that, that, that occurs and actually enters your municipal systems is really a benefit and does reduce localized flooding that can be exacerbated by the freshwater input, especially when we have an, an, um, spring and fall storms that produce a lot of rain, and now we're actually seeing winter storms that produce a lot of rain as well. So moving forward to the next series, 500, is flood damage reduction. And this is all about reducing uh, flood impacts, ways that outside of, of changing the way buildings are, managing your floodplain better, acquiring high-risk properties <coughs> and removing the development, or relocating structures out of uh, a flood zone or a high-risk high flood zone. Um, 
flood protection, uh, flood proofing uh, structures, including things like infrastructure, like like uh, sewage and, and water pump stations and other types of utilities that really need flood proofing during flood conditions. And storm drain maintenance is really important. If your if your storm uh, water management system isn't functioning properly, then it's not going to protect you against flooding. And the last series is flood preparedness. And that's about uh, warning systems and early, early warning and evacuation planning, uh, early warning systems for evacuation, or, or really just providing information about where are the, where are the places in your community that will, will actually flood first during a storm event. And uh, you don't have levee and dam safety, I, I don't think, although the Taylor River Dam it could, could potentially be a, a dam hazard here on, off, off of on 90, uh, 95. So that's sort of the, the rundown of the different types of general activities and the types of points that can be uh, acquired. And most communities, when they start, if it's the first time they've applied, their first time being in the program, they really try to go for the lo what they call the low-hanging fruit, those things that are easy to accomplish, that get the most points, that don't cost a lot of money. It totally makes sense to have that kind of approach. And that's kind of the process that Jason and Rayanne and I are, are going through right now, is going through what they have seen their issues as checklists, that falls along with each one of these types of series of activities, and we're gathering information to determine how many points under each one of the activities we actually can get, figure out where we are and the total number of points, and then figure out how to use the, the money, the technical assistance money that we receive from the Scottica Region S-Race Partnership to complete activities that will, <coughs> excuse me, either ultimately get you into the program as a, as a community or get you to the next highest level. So again, we're kind of doing that, sort of that, analysis of, so what's most cost effective, what's easiest to do in the, in the, in the tight time frame, and what, what will get us the most points. So that's a, that's a sh fairly short list of things, and a lot of it will probably hinge on things like uh, preparedness and notification and, and community outreach. So that's sort of where we're at with reviewing the checklist, and we should be finished with the checklist, I would think, within a month or so. Uh, we're just gathering some more data and some more information and, and, um, and conferring with our, the FEMA floodplain manager here for New Hampshire because sometimes some of these activities have a very wide range of points assigned to them and it's, it's hard to sometimes to determine what, what end of the spectrum you fall in under. So we're, we'll be doing sort of that verification with, with our FEMA floodplain coordinator, Jennifer Gilbert, after we've gone through the FEMA review. But it's looking pretty good because, I mean, this community I think has pretty, you have, you have some, you know, some fairly, you know, up-to-date uh, development regulations and your zoning is pretty up to date and you have a lot of information in your, in your master plan and other, other documents and you certainly have um, a fairly well, uh, um, well equipped and knowledgeable emergency management team so that goes a long way towards getting some more points too. So I'm going to estimate of where we're at point wise just close you no know, it's, it's really hard to tell because some of the some of the the, the points that uh, require that get the highest highest rate uh, some of the activities that have the highest points are have a really big range like from 28 to 328 so it's really hard to figure out where you are in the range until we, we meet with Jennifer to kind of figure to, to do that that that, that analysis <laughs> it's looking pretty good though I think I think well, at least getting in at the, at the bottom level as a Consumer that has flood insurance. Uh -huh. Is this automatic to our flood insurance that we get the discounts? Or do we have to do it? Like, so we say we get so many points that we're getting 15% discount. Is that automatic or is it something that we have to go ask for? No, there's a, once you are admitted to the program, you get some sort of certification and you get a number, I think, assigned to you. And, and any policyholder would, would, would submit that information or, or, or when they filed a claim or something or whatever, they would actually be able to be under that certification number. So that number is the town's number. Right, and it would be, uh, I think it, it wouldn't, no one, no no individual property owner has to go through, I think, uh, any kind of any kind of um, certification or approval process. It's really just, once you're entered into the program, there's some kind of community, you know, category that you're in, and it becomes more of an automated process. But but I think what it's going to require, when you, if you do enter the program, is a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, education to, to property owners, particularly those that don't have flood insurance right now. Um, there are a lot of people who, who own their properties outright, have no mortgage, no lien on their home, and they are not required to have flood insurance, and some don't because it costs a lot of money. But if they were to be allowed to pay a drastically reduced amount, uh, premium in exchange for the, you know, some, some peace of mind and some security of having flood insurance, that's, that's a huge benefit for those people who choose not to have it for whatever reason now. Um, 
So this, it's not only the people who have it now, but those who may choose to get it in the future if they can get it at a lesser price. Um, any more questions before we move on? Do preferred policies get the discounts as well? I don't know what preferred policies are. That are not in the uh, primary flood zones. But oh, not in the flood zone. I am not sh certain of that of that answer. Okay. Then I have we another find. Oh. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Give me a, a statistical probability that we'll be able to get in the program in May. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see. Let me quickly look. Well, the section I'm working on right now is I, I need to, to I need to meet with Chris Jacobs to go over the stormwater management and some of the uh, developments uh, specifics uh, about documenting certain things and keeping certain uh, maintenance elements up and those those are high point getters so there's a, there's a good chunk right there I feel really confident that you're going to make it into the, the into the base level I, I'm I, I can't I just really hard to give you a number right now I wish we could have given, given you a range but we're just not quite at that point yet would you be happy to have you come back in April? Absolutely, I will. Well, actually, you know what? If we if we if we get to a point where we're fairly fairly confident that we've we've reached a certain point, we'll let you know immediately. We won't wait till April. <laughs> All right. When is um, when are they going to certify the new flood maps? Have they got any closer to saying? I think it's spring. Yeah. Still very vague. Yeah. Because this was done what last March. Yeah. Well, there's an appeal period that I think lasts through the end of this year, or it may even bleed in, into January a little bit. And then there's a 90-day waiting period for that for, uh, on top of that. So that takes us into like an April time frame. And then once that happens, you, you, you immediately can enact a, it's a, there's a special RSA um, that, that allows co communities to um, adopt, adopt them with outside of a, you know, a town uh, warn article cycle or a town meeting cycle. You, can you, you have to go through a public process, but it's something you can do immediately once you get notification and the 90-day period has elapsed. And the 90-day period is that you have to, once the maps are, 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 are finalized, you have, to, you have to submit a notice of a notice of intent, an NOI, or, or an NO something. And some kind of notice that you are going to accept the maps, you're going to adopt the maps, and it's a, it's a procedural thing. So it can happen very quickly once that period has elapsed. Probably some kind of public, public it, And who does exactly. that? The town? The town does it. What is the uh, highest rated community in New Hampshire that's currently in there? Peterborough. And what is their rate? Um, I think they are an um, eight. They may be a seven. Oh, you know what? Here's to answer your question, actually, on the, pa on the third page of the, of the handout here. There is, there is a different percentage of discount for a non, what's called a special flood hazard area. And if you're outside of the, the actual regulatory floodplain, you get a lesser discount, but you still get a discount. And it's the middle column on that table right there. Um, they, have, they have riverine floodplains, which are, of course, are far different than coastal floodplains. But they do, have, they do have a fairly high population in their riverine areas and in their floodplain. And I was told by an insurance company you don't get any discount if you're not in the floodplain. Well, it appears according to this table, and you know what, if you want, I can um, get your email and I can forward you the information. I can forward you the answer tomorrow. But it looks to me like um, preferred policies are available only in the B, B, C, and X zones for properties that are shown to have minimal risk of flooding. They don't, don't receive premium rate credits, meaning the highest level under the CRS, um, but has a lower premium than other policies that you are limited to in these zones, a 5% discount, although it does show if, you're, if your community uh, goes up to a 6 rating or higher, then you get 10%. So the base would be 5%. Well, that would probably take another year to get up to 6. Yeah, yeah, a little, a little bit. <laughs> and some of the activities are, are, are pretty rigorous, and they require some, a lot of uh, changes into the way we, 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 we do things as far as building in, on the landscape. So it's any other questions before we move on? In the audience? The next one is the next uh, one page. It's a two-page handout. And I just thought this was really neat to, to actually uh, show um, 
the amount of savings that, that a property can actually acquire. So this is on the second page. There is a, a graphic, and it has three different little graphics of a home. And the first one, so this is uh, under the, the, new, the new 2012 uh, Flood Insurance Reform Act. Um, for a property that's valued at, I don't know what it says, it says what, what it's valued at. The first graphic shows that, that this home is below, four feet below the base flood elevation. So the 100-year floodplain base flood elevation, which ranges between 8.5 to 10.5 here in, in Hampton, Hampton Beach, um, four feet below puts it well into the floodplain and well into a, a flood risk area. So for, on a yearly basis, the annual premium for that property would be $9,500. And over a period of 10 years, of course, that would be $95,000 just in flood insurance premiums for insurance. If that building were elevated right to the base flood elevation, it would, you can see that the premium is substantially decreased, tenfold almost. And you can see that over a period of 10 years, it would only be paying $14,000 in premiums. And if that same home were elevated three feet above the base flood elevation, their premium would be reduced for less than, less than $500 a year. And their total premium over a period of 10 years would be about $4,300. So you can see, with, m with minor elevation of structures, getting them out of the flood, the flood zone and the flood elevation, there's substantial savings. Um, so it, it, on average, depending on the size of a home um, and a, a building like this, I'm not sure if it would even be feasible. But average cost to elevate a, an existing structure is about $20,000. So you can see if you do the math, if someone were to elevate their structure who is in the four feet below base flood elevation and take it into um, just the, the, just the, uh, the uh, at base flood of elevation, um, they could pay, f pay for it in a period of 10 years. In less than 10 years, they could pay for that. Um, and pay less every year for their flood insurance premiums. So, there's really uh, an incentive for property owners to be proactive about protecting their properties by elevating them. Um, and the more you elevate, the higher, the, you know, the more, the more, the more uh, safe you are from flood. And I think you, if a lot of us probably saw a lot of pictures from Hurricane Sandy of properties down in North, on the New Jersey shore. Those that were elevated and flood-proofed were still standing after the storm, and those that, that, that didn't weren't were not. In most cases, they were just gone altogether. Um, so this, this makes a really good case for not only the community being proactive, and, and if, you enacted, if you enacted standards that required that new homes be, be elevated, you could make the case that you're doing it because you could pay $9,500 a year or you could pay $427 a year. So if, you, if the community decides to go for, to a regulatory approach requiring that all new development and all new structures be elevated, really, you really can rationalize it that it's a, it's a, it's a money-saving effort. And, and especially when you're building, if you're doing a substantial renovation or you're doing a new, new construction, it, it's even less expensive than doing the retrofitting of raising an existing building. And, and I, I just want to mention that, and Bob knows all about this, um, and I'm uh, getting a certificate of elevation. Yes. So that, that you've got to start somewhere. You've got to find out where you are. Right. And that is already, the town already requires that, and they keep those on, on file. They do if you're going to build something new, but if it's mm -hmm. an existing Right. <coughs> somebody to come in and, and figure out. Do a survey. Yep. Yeah, exactly, and find out where, where I am because I may very well, I'd be very pleased to find out that I'm four feet above or three feet. <laughs> I got 427 a year. That's, that's right. That's in my budget. <laughs> that's right. And this, these, 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 uh, this was calculated, I, I believe this, this brochure was, was done in 2013, and it was calculated on the the, the Reform Act, once it, the Reform Act went into place. So it would be the savings you would see under, under, the, new, under the new FEMA NFIP program, not the existing one. I, ha I have a, on, on your handout, which I can actually provide digitally because it will have the URLs so that you can just click on and you can find all these online. I, and this is the, the, um, the website addresses for these brochures are actually on the, the agenda that I gave you. So I just wanted to kind of move on, I guess, to um, talk about one thing that the community has to do as, as a prerequisite um, that goes along with their application, and it's called repetitive loss area mapping. And it requires the community to take, uh, FEMA gives them a list of all their repetitive loss properties, so those are properties that have uh, two or more flood, substantial flood losses. Um, in 10 years, thank you. <laughs> 
Um, and that information is kept confidential. It's not something that's publicly available. But what we're going to be doing is creating a map, a map, and we're going, we are going to identify those, those, those on a preliminary map that will be an internal piece of document. Um, and then we're going to start looking at uh, group, a pattern. Do they form a pattern? Are they all clumped in a certain area? Which we definitely can see that already happening. Um, and then we were going to look at places and then other places on the lands, the places on the landscape, you know, across the entire beach and across the entire floodplain, including in the back of the Hampton Seabrook estuary, that are low-lying and will be the first places to flood and the most vulnerable to flooding. Flooding not only from a storm, but from things like the highest, you know, tides, uh, unusual storm tides. We see flooding in Hampton all the time, um, on, on, red, on more than one t once or twice a year. So what we're going to be using is one of the products from our Tides to Storms um, mapping that we did as part of this project. So as part of this project, we actually we mapped incremental or a range of sea plausible sea level rise projections. So from 1.7 1, 1 feet to 4 feet to 6.3 feet of sea level rise. So what we're going to do is use it as a surrogate for showing where the lowest parts and the most vulnerable, the vulnerable parts of the landscape are to show where flooding will actually occur most often and most frequently and first. So the colors range from light green to a medium green to dark green, which I know it's really hard for you to see. And actually, you do have a map. Uh, so the green colored map is a, is, a, is a small map of this, and it may be a little easier to see if it's closer to you. Um, and so what we're going to do on the repetitive loss property is for the, the show the floodplain boundary, where, where the extent of the floodplain is. But then lay on this 1.7 feet of flooding. Um, it's it's, on this map, it's for sea level rise, but we're just going to say, what if we had 1.7 feet of flooding from a storm? Where would it go, and what, par what it par parts of the, of the, of the um, town would it flood? And you can definitely see those light green areas on the back parts of um, Brown Avenue, where we are now, along the west of Ashworth Avenue. And especially along the route uh, 51101, and, and as you enter in, that's just the name of this, this street that comes into the beach, the main Highland. Um, but that's a very, very, very low area, and you definitely can see it. I mean, you can see that the marsh comes really close to the road. It's very low-lying, and at high tide water, almost feels like it's at a higher elevation than the road is in some places. So wherever you see those, those, those light, light green colored, colored areas, we're going to sort of look at what the pattern is. In the back parts of the, of the estuary, they're definitely all along the fringe of the existing uh, high mm -hmm. tide line. But over in the beach, it, it tends to get a little more spotty, and you start to really pick up some places that are really, 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 really at risk for flooding. So we're going to map those and start to create a look, look to see where the repetitive loss properties are. Uh, we, we're, I'm going to assume they're going to be in that light green area. Um, and then, then also look at the, the, next, the next level, four, four, point, four, four feet of flooding, to see if we pick up more properties and we pick up more areas. So. By using this, this um, incremental flooding, we can start to see and test this, what we call the sensitivity of the landscape to flooding, where the lowest parts are. So we're going to use that as a surrogate to map the repetitive, what we would, would, would suggest would be places where you may see more repetitive loss over time, especially in the light green area. And start to look at how many parcels are actually in those light green areas. We won't, probably won't name them, but we'll actually maybe pick out see how many are residential, how many are commercial, how many are municipal facilities. Mm -hmm. I know Chris Jacobs was really interested in this map because his wastewater treatment plant is over here. <laughs> and you can see this green and this green around it. And so when we were having our discussions in, as part of our Tides to Storms project, he, he definitely paid co close attention to the, these maps. So that's sort of what the repetitive loss um, mapping component is, and that's what we're working on right now. That, that. And it will help to inform, I think, additional activities that the town may want to do to kind of increase its, point, its points, because I think that maybe even increasing the level of education around these low-lying, uh, more, more uh, uh, sensitive and vulnerable areas would, will qualify for, for points under the CRS. So that's one of the things we're working on right now is that repetitive loss map. And when, when, we, when it's finished, we'll, we'll sh definitely <coughs> share it with you and, and, and describe our findings, what we found. Oh, I'm just a little confused. Is the light green 1.7 or 4.0? The lightest green is 1.7. From this key, it looks like it's 4.0. Yeah, I know. The, the, the colors in the key are a little bit lighter than the colors on the map. 
But what you can see is that the medium green, what, what we have to do is we lay on the light green, which comes out to here, then you lay on the four. But when you, when you get to four feet of flooding, basically what you, what you are, your four feet plus the 1.7 gets flooded. So it's almost like an additive thing. So you can see a little fringe of darker green, a medium green, and then the darker, the darker green moving out. So it looks like a, like, a, like a kaleidoscope kind of scale of color. So once you, once you jump, jump a category or, or a level in flooding, it's, it's everything below that and everything to that point. So 1.7 is included as part of 4. And so there isn't any white? No, it's green. It's the light green, yeah, that you're looking at. Okay, so this looks white. So, so this is the light green. This is no, it's confusing. I apologize. It's 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 well, no, this is this light green. That's light green. Yes. Sorry, yes. 1.7 is light green. So this right here is, is that, that. Is that color? Okay. So okay, that's what I could say. Okay. Yeah. It's just it's far enough away that you can't really. Yeah. It's like an optical. This thing. is a mapping <laughs> problem, and we tried to rectify it and had a hard time. On this map, um, I'll yeah. show you the purple part. Well, the blue is open water, and everything that's purple, the colored purple, is area that's already submerged during high tide, the <coughs> highest mean tide. So what we wanted to show was everything that's above t the upland that's dry today that doesn't, doesn't receive any tidal action that would be flooded. So we didn't want to exaggerate the amount of flooding because this is already tidal marsh, the purple. So when we, we lay these colors on, these green colors on top of that purple, these are transparent, and what, what happens is that it changes the colors a little bit. So, just, so right here is Bullis Head, and they're not colored at all. A little bit, right around the edge. From You're just around, around the edge, edge, right? And then from the back. That's, that's very high. And then from the back right here, right along, mm -hmm. a little bit east of little bit, morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most of Ocean sure. Boulevard is. The ones that are, this, you know, there's no color. Those yep. are not in the flood Just a little bit. Just those little pieces. Okay. Oh, actually, you bring up a really good question, point. I don't, sh the, the floodplain flood plain is not shown on here, but a, an interesting artifact of mapping different levels of sea level is that all of those, including up to the 6.3, they all nest within the 100-year floodplain. They're almost a surrogate for it. So basically, when you get out to the dark green, that is the limit of the 100-year floodplain. So, so one thing we, we think about when we were taught in, in the Tides to Storms project is that so we have our current 100-year floodplain. It's a regulatory floodplain. It has a regulatory framework. <coughs> it has insurance associated with it. It has development standards at the municipal level associated with it. The more we can build more flood reduction and reduce the vulnerability and risk of flooding in the 100-year floodplain, the more it will actually make sure it, it'll ensure that you have more protection over the long term for sea level rise because they're the same. They have the same extent. And this is yeah. the, an example of the new flood. This is not a flood map. This, well, but it's an example of it sort of, of is of the applied. It, 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 it's pretty much the equivalent. In some places, it go. This goes a little bit beyond the floodplain. In some places, it doesn't quite make it. Um, but for the most part, these all this green is contained in the higher floodplain. I think the interesting thing is that it's you know we, we're we're sitting here on this beach, just this little piece right here. But all of the you know going up Taylor River, all of those properties are affected. There's a lot of a lot of properties affected. There is. I mean, this this is a very squiggly and irregular line, and it covers a, a tremendous mileage of yeah. shoreline here. This is Seabrook, of course, but mm -hmm. as you go up, and when you look at the other thing that we did with, with for, as part of this mapping, this mapping project is we took the sea level rise um, projections and we laid them on top of the existing 100-year floodplain. And what that shows is how big, how much enlarged the floodplain could become over time in properties that will become be in the floodplain potentially if any one of these scenarios actually happens. So there's management uh, implications with respect to you may not be in the floodplain now, but you may be in 50, 40 years or less. You don't really know. So it, it puts people on, on notice, basically, that you're going to build a house and you're really close to this area or you're in the other, the other maps we made. Where, where this is what we call the scary map. <laughs> scary map. This is the um, the, the sea level rise plus the floodplain on top of it. You want? Uh, I, I can do it. That's okay. And so this shows you so how much the floodplain enlarges. If you take the current floodplain and you add two feet, one point seven feet onto it, you, if you add four, if you add six point three, you end up with flooding that goes beyond <coughs> I ninety five into the Taylor River. I and just so want to show that this is the precinct here. This little section. Yeah. So this is 
Okay. Big area that's right. covered, but we're only here. Right. So it's, it's a so big difference. So what happens is substantial amounts of the of the of the of the, of the, of the beach system are, are flooded um, in, at a hundred years from. Whereas today, not as much. But um, so anyway, th those maps are all available, and you you can go on our, on the RPC website and and find them. They're all digital. There are copies of the maps and copies of the report that we did, which uh, analyzes the amount of road, road impact, miles of road impacts, and infrastructure impacts, and critical facilities, and all of that. Um, and I think you have these uptown, right? Yeah, yeah. they're called so the town yeah. office. They have to. But you can go online and open up the PDF on on your computer, and it's really neat because you can actually zoom in quite quite closely and see um, a lot of detail. Um, if you open them up the app on, on your computer. And it's just, it's www.rpc-nh.org. And then you, there's, a, there's a project um, link on the front page, and it'll take you right to where all the maps and reports are. rpc-nh.org. nh.org. Does FEMA, or rather, does flood insurance ever be denied to someone who continues to rebuild with multiple repetitive losses? Mm -hmm. At what point does that occur? I think it's, it used to be a th what's called three strikes and you're out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure under the new act what it is. I could find, we could find out though. Do you happen to know? No, but there is a limit. Yep, there is a, there is a limit. There's a dollar limit and then, and then there's that three times and you have to, you have to improve your property so it doesn't happen again. And once they're no longer able to be insured, they're no longer contributing to the premium loss basis for the cost of the insurance, yes. correct? Yes. And in many cases, they are unable to get private insurance. But a lot of you know property owners that own their properties outright, and those that have enough money to rebuild if they get if they get damaged, they don't care how many times it happens; they can they can just fix it. That's a pretty substantial uh, amount of people who live on the coastline because of the high property values. Um, there's a lot of people who don't carry insurance for that reason. But that's okay because they are not jacking the premium. Of the flood by insurance. getting getting the benefit, right? Yeah, so exactly. If you want to self-insure, you're not putting everybody at risk. Right. Open your doors and windows. That's true. Go through. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> so I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I, I just uh, I just want to let you know that actually this pro this project, this this flood uh, assessment, was actually funded through FEMA, through the New Hampshire uh, Office of uh, Homeland Security and Emergency Management. They are very interested in looking at the projected conditions and seeing what parts of the of the coastline of the state were were vulnerable to flooding in the future. So. It was funded through FEMA. So just a couple more things. Um, an update. Uh, as part of this project, we actually, uh, as a follow-on, we applied, our, the Rocky and Planning Commission applied to the Northeast Region Ocean Council, which is a Gulf of Maine organization, for a, a small grant to, um, to give small grants and technical assistance to all the seven coastal communities to implement some of the recommendations that came out of this project. And um, Hampton applied, and they're going to be looking at um, making revisions and amendments to their floodplain ordinance which if they do amend, it probably won't happen until 2017, but a lot of those amendments could potentially bump you up into the next class. If, if, you, if you get in at the low, low level, you could actually, by the following year, uh, gain an entire class just by that particular exercise. So we'll be working through the next, through September, to make some recommendations to revise the floodplain ordinance. And I got an email from Jennifer Gilbert today at the Office of Energy and Planning that she'd be happy to help, help with that effort. Um, and the last, the last uh, item on the agenda is number five, and I just thought you might get a kick out of this. It's kind of interesting. Um, this is uh, it links to the 2014 and the 2015 King Tide Photo Contest. Has anyone, anyone hear of the King Tide Photo Contest? Because Hampton's quite famous in it. <laughs> um, it is the highest uh, uh, astronomical tide of the year. It typically happens at the end of October. And... Uh, the Piscataqua Region Estuary, Estuaries Partnership and the Coastal Adaptation Work Group uh, hosted the 2013 and 2014 King Tide Photo Contest. And this year, we partnered with the Gulf of Maine. So we were part of Nova Scotia, Maine, uh, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire all kind of went in it together. And let me tell you, uh, on that particular day, Hampton Beach becomes a poster child for, for King Tide and the highest tide in flooding, especially the streets off of Brown Ave, Page Lane, Pages Lane, and different different those 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 small streets off of Brown Avenue and um, Cross Beach Road. Oh no, sorry, that's in Seabrook. And five, be um, safe. But uh, yeah, so you are prominently featured in, in those photos. So you, it, it's worth it's worth a look. Also, Seabrook is too. Um, 
So. Yeah, they're they're interesting. They are they are interesting. And and a couple the first two years ago, three years ago, it was a bright sunny day, but there was an offshore storm or something, and boy, the flooding was in, it was was bad. And the next year, it was kind of rainy and a little bit windy, but it, but it wasn't too bad. This past year, it was moderate but not horrible. But for someone whose yard gets flooded or the driveway gets flooded, it's, it's not that's not that's fun. That's not a good experience. So, um, well, most of the beach was fine. Um, the beach actually was good. The waves were, were pretty robust that day, and the beach looked like it was pretty good. The water was a lot higher, of course, but everything looked okay. Um, so I just wanted to let you know of that, and you might be interested in seeing some of the photos. You might see your, 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 your homes in some of them. You might see your house in them. So that's all I had for you tonight um, is an update, and I wish I could, we could have been a little bit further along, but we will be shortly, and I think probably by the time we, we celebrate the new year, you'll get an answer as to what, what level you are. You'll, uh, like most likely be in the scenes when we apply for CRS. Yeah. One final question. Do you get points for evacuation route signage? I don't know if you get for signage. Here's the thing. In New Hampshire, municipalities can't do signage. You cannot post evacuation route signage. I know you can't post them on state highways. You may be able to post them on local roads, but not state highways. So it has to be a state thing. That's actually something we looked at closely because we, uh, we actually have another set of maps, and this would be really good if you wanted to look at these. Um, we did a road sensitivity mapping, so we took the three sea level rise scenarios, and we color-coded all the road segments, and it color-coded it to wh what level it flooded at. And you really start to see the, the, the really sensitive part segments of Route 1A um, as you con continue to raise the, the, the level. And what we found across the board was going from 1.7 to 4 feet of flooding really dramatically increased the amount of impact across the board. Critical facilities, roads, everything. Um, and so a lot, a lot, at, by the time you get to 6.3 feet, uh, significant portions of the one are impacted by flooding. Um, and it's interesting, I was talking with some counter, counter counterparts in Massachusetts at the Coastal Zone Management Program, and they said they found the same thing in their mapping. It's an artifact of what the level of sea level is today, and you know, how, what are our tides are like, and all that. It's just sort of a, it's a New England sort of a break point, I think. But that would be really interesting for you to look at the, the roads because it gets, interestingly enough, large segments of Route 1A actually sometimes don't get flooded un under these scenarios until you get to a storm scenario. But what happens is all the local roads get, get flooded on, on the west side. And that has huge implications for uh, road maintenance. Uh, if the town decided to elevate these roads, it really it has to tie into whatever the, the, uh, what the state does to Route 1A. And so when we start looking at features that are linear, like um, water and sewer pipelines and local road connections, driveway access, all those things, whenever you change the elevation of one thing, it changes the elevation of everything else next to it. So there are lots, lots of questions and lots of uh, engineering uh, problems and questions that need, need probably to, down the road need to be answered. Well, right now, the Ocean Boulevard is at least a foot over where it should be. And because of the way the roads are, that mo a lot of the properties get flooded just from runoff. Yes. Because there's no, now with a new 10-year plan that we're involved in to redo Ocean Boulevard, mm -hmm. hopefully we're getting, going to get moved up in that, um, that plan. Uh, that'll be dropping at least a foot. Mm -hmm. And if that makes, that'll make a huge difference in a lot of the properties that are along Ocean Boulevard, that water runs into their, into their stores, into their... Uh -huh. Building, so that should be interesting. When it rains, when it rains, yeah. just rain alone, never mind, a, never right. mind a, a major flooding. Right. We have a great sewer system. It's a I, would the town spend twelve million? Like that? We have one little section of uh, the village district that should be finished at some point, right? No, but we should work on that one this year. Maybe Jason knows. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting to see when they do the redo Ocean Boulevard, the drainage is a big issue. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, it, it, it is in Seabrook, too. It's drainage off of uh, Route 1A. 286 is a lot of fun for Seabrook. Oh, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's actually the, the, the second probably most popular uh, poster child is Brown's Lobster Pond and, uh, and Route 286 and Cross Beach Road, which actually I saw John Starkey yesterday at a meeting, and he um, was very, very happy that to report that they actually did put some fill on, on the road, and then now it's um, nice and high, well, higher than it was before. Well, that hill in Hampton Falls must be one, that when you're coming down on Route 1. Route 1, route one in Hampton mm -hmm. Falls, yep. Um, 
uh, right here, it's right here between Hampton, between the 101 interchange and Hampton um, Falls Center. No. That's very no, well. No, coming down the hill. Coming down from the center of Hampton Falls and the seagull. Oh, after the light, yeah, and going south. Right, right, right. Oh, okay, over here, right here. Yep, yep. Yes, yes, that's it. That's the other, the other, other low spot. Definitely. And you don't even want to talk about rye. You, you'd be lucky you're not rye. <laughs> <laughs> rye is you know, low. They have lower taxes. If I can make a comment. Sure. I was talking to a friend who's a realtor, and uh, she has a property for sale on Seabrook Beach that's three houses in from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And she was telling me that um, it's for sale, and she's got to tell potential buyers that if it's their primary residence, then the uh, flood insurance is a certain amount. If it's your second home, then the on that particular property, the insurance was uh, $4,600 a year. And is that more or less than primary? It was more. It's higher. Much it's like $1,000 more. And she said that um, it's affecting the sale of that house yep. because um, if somebody comes in with cash then it's no problem but if somebody's going to have a mortgage um, it's actually affecting not only the sale but the value of the house mm -hmm. now if i was talking to rayan and jason before the meeting started and along the coastline at longhampton for instance and up north beach that's and, and even at the place called, that's some of the most expensive and highly um, taxed property. Mm -hmm. But if this flooding has the potential mm -hmm. of reducing those the um, the value of that property, and that's going to affect not just the beach; it's going to affect the town because if the values of the property at the, mm -hmm. along the coast go down, then the you know uptown's going to have to pick up the slack. Right, and that's why that diagram that s shows the difference if you elevate your home is so is so is so profound, and it's so it's it's compelling for property owners to to um, to take some steps to 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 flood proof their homes and elevate them because it saves them money, but it, it would it would actually uh it would actually re re retain the property value because it would be out of the out of the flood the, the flood elevation. So, that's so it's a win win both ways. Well, that's when an elevation certificate is. Uh, it, it's you almost you almost have to start with that. Yeah, you do. You know, yeah. And find out where you are with the elevation, and then figure out what you want to do from there. And that's why CRS, I think that the FEMA is really trying to to to, to encourage communities, especially those that have a high a high percentage of, of flood insurance rate policies. Those like Hampton Falls only have a handful. They would never do CRS because it's really not worth all the effort it takes to actually do it. But because the community has a stake in how how safe these properties are uh, from flooding uh, it goes to the tax base it goes to the community character it goes to the you know the viability of the whole beach atmosphere and character I mean it, it's a two-way street it's not just you know the value of private property it affects the entire community and that's why the CRS is a community driven process and if you when you look through the different series that's why the community outreach components are so high the CRS the, the, what FEMA really wants to do is get the word out that this is this is a serious issue, but there are solutions and there are ways to reduce your costs. But the, but it's but it's at the same time you're doing it, you're getting a reduced cost because you're reducing your risk, and that's what they want. They want to see because that that helps them. That helps them, uh, even though they're collecting less money, they'll be having fewer claims, and that's what they want to see: fewer claims. Just a question: Are you familiar with um, Oh, I didn't. I know VHB. I didn't know they were doing a transportation <coughs> update. I'm just curious because they were actually talking about tax worth that is extremely low. Mm -hmm. They go to and they're talking about making it two way traffic, changing the whole traffic path down here. Uh -huh. I didn't know if any of this stuff mm -hmm. has any effect on It may. It may. Um, if any of you were involved in that, if you wanted to, to alert them to this study, I'm sure they may be interested in, in the maps. Do you know I'm who the? Them, I'm showing them pictures like you said on a bright sunny day, October 29th. That was King Tide Day. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, I got pictures on a nice sunny day of each flood in the bottom of the island. Uh, yeah. This whole area around um, backwards. Oh, definitely. Yeah. If you want to drive your car through, let's know what you got. Right. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> 
So we will, we'll get you an update as soon as we possibly can. If we do, whenever we have an answer, we will certainly convey it to you and let you know what we think the, the, the possibility or the possible entry point would be into CRS and keep you posted about what we're doing and we'll make the repetitive loss map available when it becomes um, available or made for the public. So that's what we're doing. I just wanted to say, it. you know, I wanted to congratulate your, your planners here. They're, they're really um, taking a lot of proactive actions to help the community and bring technical assistance and money and we, we kind of see have seen that across the board. Seabrook, Rye, Portsmouth, all, all of the coastal communities have been really interested in, in and they feel re responsible for getting this information and using the information. So um, they deserve a little bit of credit. <laughs> I'm just I'm just I'm just the hired help. <laughs> Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, I hope we come back with really good news. Yeah. Mm. Anna, Jason, do you want to add anything or are we Mm -hmm. no, thank you for all you guys are doing. It's, it's super. I really appreciate it. You don't. You don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. Oh. If you'd like to leave now, I'll okay. You'll watch it on television. So uh, <laughs> gather up our stuff and. Yeah. Exactly. Did you? Is there all the members here? I have an extra copy. If anyone didn't get it. No, no, we all said. I think. Did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, I'm going to go right to old business, and I and I know Uda is uh, getting a little tired because she has to work early in the morning. So um, one of the uh, one of the Warren articles last year was uh, to contribute five thousand dollars from the village district to bring the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Unfortunately, for this year coming up. Uh, the dates that we wanted weren't available, so um, we're going to put it toward, we're going to put it back into the budget and then bring, bring it forward after we talk to the lawyer the best way to do it, whether we do have to do another Warren article or if we can just put it into our budget for next year. Uh, and the dates were, Ura, do you remember the dates? Were So, of 2017, we're looking at the 30th of August, September 4th, 2017. And then if that's not available, we're looking at maybe the week before, and then if that's the case, we're going to have to maybe move the idol and move some things back. Uh, but I think that's, that's a great weekend. Uh, but it's 2017, not 2016. So don't don't worry, Glenn. We're looking at 2016. Yeah. All right. Do Do you want to add anything to that, or, or any information? I him up tomorrow in Washington D.C. Yeah. I put your dates in, and I stress for him we really want Labor Day. <coughs> okay. But if he doesn't want to give us Labor Day, we take the week before. All right. Excellent. Because they did the rules. I put in the week before Labor Day, like we discussed. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are not on the same route as they go around. Right. It's all the, the, the way they do the route. Right. So if we're in early yeah, enough for 17, exactly. they might be able to put other people around us. I hope so. it works out for 2017. And all right. Excellent. That's the work we were looking for earlier. No. No, it isn't. Um, we can put it on the ballot, or we can um, maybe put just put it into the budget. we will see the best way to do it. So we'll ask. That's the attorney. We'll have to know. That's what we're going to find out. Well, there's no reason we can't put it in the budget, and if people don't want it, they can take it out of the budget. Yeah. Because it's already been approved by the voters, so we know the voters want it. It's just unfortunate we can't have it for now. So um, that, that's how we'll bring it forward. And uh, but. I want to talk to legal counsel to make sure we do it correctly. We don't want any surprises in 2017. So. Um, Kathy, I'm going to bring. I'm going to have you get up and talk about New Year's. But first, I want to talk about New Year's um, BZ on the corner, which is a small convenience store. They do subs and pizzas and stuff like that and coffees. They have offered to supply coffee and hot cocoa for the night of New Year's. Good group. 
and we're going to have them get the cookies and everything else. So they're going to bring everything down to you, so you don't have to worry about it. And uh, I will, I will, if you go into the store, thank Bill and Soraya. They're awesome. They want to. They're open year round. They um, obviously we all love the beach here, and uh, they want to contribute to an event at the beach. So that's their that's their contribution. So go in and have a Bill and Soraya, and Sugar is their little dog that's in the doorway every day barking at you. All right. So would you want to get up and talk about New Year's and fireworks and what you're going to be doing? Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Kathy Silver from Blue Ocean Society and the Blue Ocean Discovery Center. Um, this is really very simple. For the last, we're going to be doing exactly what we've done for the last couple of years. We will open at six o'clock on New Year's Eve, and people can come in free of charge, and there'll be coffee, hot chocolate, and cookies there. And we will have interpreters for the tank so they can see everything. And you know, just give them the regular display. And then go watch the fireworks. We're usually open, it's usually like 6 to 8 because then everybody, well, what time, uh, what time are we doing the fireworks? I believe it was 8. 8, eight, 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 eight yes, eight because eight of course everybody clears out and they go off to the fireworks and then we close. Yeah. And, um, I have a question. Yeah. I don't know whether you weren't here or I was, I was here, but anyway. Um, Halloween. How did the Halloween party go? I didn't hear anything about it. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Yeah. A lot we of had, people? We did. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember the number, but it was a lot. Okay. Good. Yeah, it was very good. Yep. And um, so, hope to see you New Year's. Do you need volunteers for New Year's? Is that um, actually, I'm all, for? I'm all set, as long as all the people who tell me they were going to volunteer actually do. All right. yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's yeah. excellent. And um, as always, we're open for donations because other than that, I mean, we actually kind of lose money that night. <laughs> well, yeah. we got the uh, okay. Kathy, don't coffee and cocoa and cookies oh. are all going to be. There was an article in yesterday's Hampton Union talking about inviting people to come to the fireworks and that talked about the Blue Ocean. Oh. And it said that you had 469 guests. Last year. Last year. We and did? I was I was there with John Kane. Right. And the line was out the it door was and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing to see the line of people. It, it was amazing. I had to I usually man, manage the door and I couldn't let people in until people went out. It, yeah. we this is very well attended. Yeah. So when you have time, talk to me about what we need built to supply. Sure. sure. We don't want to run out of anything. Right. And maybe we can set up a different yeah. way so it moves smooth. And, and not well, see, the thing is, they come in, they get their coffee, they get their cookies, and then they want to learn about the lobsters, and they want to see. It's not just the food. Right. I mean that. They, and plus, it's cold, and it's a warm place. Well, yeah. <laughs> so that way, so it's hard to move them along. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But um, yeah. So they're looking at all the animals and everything. So Excellent. It does take a little while to make your way through. To make sure that John Kane brings the. Village District's uh, video camera this year yes. takes some pictures and video of, yeah. of all the crowds. It's, it's it is really a crowd. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And is the state having their open house that night? I think they are. That's what I heard, so well, we should check on that. Didn't did. John say something about a slideshow on the stage? That won't be happening this year. Logistically, it's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah, all those people who are waiting in line to get into the Discovery Center could watch this last Exactly. Exactly. That would be a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bob, any other old business? No. no. Maureen? Yes. Okay. I'd like to discuss the parade. That was your baby. Um, first of all, I want to thank John Kane, Stephen, Paula Taya, and Glenn French for all that you did, especially listening to me. Uh, Tom Higgins for the use of his truck, Continentals, Mike Roy for allowing us to use his lot to put the decorated uh, wagon in, Rich Renier for driving Miss Hampton Beach, Larry Stone for driving his vintage truck, and Chairman Ray for driving the Continentals in the parade this year. I didn't lose the Continental. No, you didn't. <laughs> it took all these I lost people. three weeks on the highway. That's all right. 
At least the people were safe. Yeah, I didn't lose a continental. A better reef than a person. It took <laughs> all of these people to bring uh, a successful entry entries into the uh, People parade. were dancing when we were going by yeah, and singing lovely. songs. I thought it was great. So Bob, we appreciate all of your help. It did take uh, literally the village to deal with this <coughs> stuff, and we appreciate it. Um, I talked to Senator Stiles today, mm -hmm. and... I don't know if you remember at one of the meeting that she was here. I had concern about our insurance at the village district, what the people on the coast pay, uh, and why we're all in a secondary market. Um, and she looked into it, and the insurance commissioner said, "Well, it's a small pool, and no one wants to take a chance on it. Sorry." So, yeah, Senator Stiles doesn't like that answer. <laughs> So she is looking into some more options to see if there's anything they can do. Um, but right now, there doesn't seem to be much mm -hmm. to be done about it. Um, your regular insurance. I don't know about, I, I know what, on, on the water, on, on Ocean Boulevard, um, because of the high winds and the storm damage that comes, it's more wind than, it's not, I'm not worried about water coming over the boulevard, but the winds and stuff, that a, a regular insurance company that you would go through will not write a policy on Hampton Beach. All right? You have to go through a secondary market. I don't think it's just business. I think it's houses and stuff, cottages that are on the water. Um, you have to go through a secondary market, companies like Lloyd's of London, and you pay a much higher premium. So um, a lot of states that have large coastlines, the insurance commissioners make regular companies take a certain amount of risk. Uh, but we have such a small coastline that um, they can't they can't seem to get people to do that. So hopefully some of the styles can come up with something or she seems to have a way of getting things done in the state. So hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll work. So. so I wanted to update everybody on that. All right, new business. Maureen. Um, I, I, do we have to make a motion to move the January uh, uh, yep. meeting? Yeah, I was going to bring that up, but you can bring it up. Well. So, um, January, so this year's meeting schedule will continue to be the second Wednesday of the month, except for January. It will be the 20th of January, which is the third Wednesday of the month. We don't have enough commissioners that week, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it'll be, it's, unless Bob, you want to run it on your own. <laughs> you can't vote like on it. anything. <laughs> <laughs> so January's meeting will be the 20th. And the rest of the year, I went over with uh, Christina at the town office, at the town manager's office. She's going to have it on the website. Will be the second Wednesday of the month. Okay. Veterans so Day is not a problem. Veterans Day is not a problem, so we don't have to worry. So I hope 22 is listening. January 20th. Is there a budget committee meeting that night? Oh, I hope so. I hope. So. <laughs> I, I hope there's no conflict for you, Jim. Well, there won't be a conflict. It's not on a Wednesday. We'll, we'll take care of that. Okay. On that, we'll approve the minutes from Chuck Wheat oh. under, old, under new business. Yeah. Do you want to um, discuss when are we going to do? We usually sit down in some part of January and do our budget. You know, prepare. A workshop type of thing is that going to happen before the 20th or after uh, i think it's going to be right after yeah, after, after. after. So okay we'll so i don't need to worry about that, that right now yeah. okay thank you so we'll announce that then and yeah. we don't really have a date set oh one more thing at the budget committee meeting um the fire department um had an issue about um special coverage for fireworks and that they would be charging people fireworks. I can see them charging individuals that are doing private shows, special events, but the village district being a municipality and part of the town of Hampton, um, I don't think is included in that or should be included in that. So I think we should have a meeting with the selectmen to go over that. We had an agreement with them, I want to say eight or nine years ago, where they definitely stood up to the plate and said, yep, we're part of the town, and the fireworks benefit the town parking lots as well as businesses in the town. <coughs> uh, they would continue as they have for 50 plus years, um, sponsor with the, with the uh, help of the firemen. 
Uh, so I'd like to set a meeting up sometime either. I'll call and uh, talk to Christina, see if we can get on the agenda within the next couple of weeks, or we'll do it sometime in January before we do our budget. Um, we'll see where they're at on that. Because he brought they, it was brought up at the budget committee meeting, and I said that's news to me because no one's called or told us anything. So um, maybe it's just an error on the fire chief's part. Um, we'll go from there. All right, on that, we're going to go for the approval of minutes from November 18th, page one, page two, page three. So I have a motion to approve the minutes from November 18th, 2015. Move to approve the minutes as written. A second. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay, any public comment? Anybody in the audience? No, seeing none. Closing comments. Tony? Wow, nobody has anything to say in the audience. Wow. Yeah. I'm at a loss here. I, <laughs> uh, I don't really have anything except Merry Christmas. All right, here you go. Everybody. Bob? No, I just echo the same feeling. Let's be kind to each other during the season. Exactly. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy New Year, and any other holiday that you celebrate. Thank you. Meeting adjourned at 637.